Well, hi there. My name is Oliver and I'm the community manager here at Might and Delight. And I hope you're all doing great. At the end of January, I asked our players to send me their questions on Discord, Steam and Reddit. Any questions they could think of, like an AMA of sorts. We got tons of them and I'll not be able to answer all of them, most notably questions about future features and releases. Um, I'm not allowed to spoil what's in development, which I'm sure you can appreciate. Um, but I have a list of questions about all sorts of things and I'm going to answer them now. First off is Mocknant who asks, As someone who hasn't played since December 2021, what's new and different that might draw me back in? Um, a lot of development has happened since then, obviously, uh, disregarding all the work that's gone into just stabilizing the play experience and smoothing out technical issues. There's also been a lot of additions in terms of features and other kinds of content. Character customization has been expanded since release, and uh, we've rebalanced the way depth in the game is handled. Several events, locations and achievements have been added, vehicles have been improved, fishing has been revamped, um, Taking a scroll through the news section of the Steam Community Hub will give a more comprehensive view of the progress that's been made, and there's a lot more to come. Ronnie asks, when will the combat be fixed? Uh, we have our new combat system running on preview service right now, and we plan to have it up and running in the production build of the game in the spring. Not like nailing down a date right now because we want to actually meet the date, but it's soon. Toolicious asks, are there any plans to change or provide alternative options when it comes to the 24 hour day and night cycle? Okay, so we recognize that the real time day and night cycle is one of the more controversial aspects of the Book of Travels experience for some. And I get it on a personal level too, since I get most of my playtime at night as well. We are experimenting with a system that would potentially alleviate some of that frustration while still functioning within the event system we have in place. Um, sorry for not being able to share more details right now, but stay tuned. Paddy221 asks, Is Book of Travels close to being done slash complete? I mean, sh sure, in, in relation to where the game was when we launched in Early Access in October 21. Uh, we're much closer. I, I sense that the real meaning behind the question might be, when are we leaving Early Access and launching 1.0? And to that I can only say, um, no comment. Sorry. Sivan Vartano asks, Will there be plans to release an Art of Book of Travels book at any point in time? Uh, I assume that the question is about the physical thing, rather than something you can download. Uh, there are no plans set in stone for this, but we talked about it and would love to do something like this if there is a demand for it. Might and Delight is probably best known for its artistic prowess, and Book of Travels in particular is such a goldmine of great art, in my opinion, so yeah. Uh, I think it would be cool. Um, it would require a good amount of work and thus a certain amount of money to make. We wouldn't want to just put some work files in a PDF and print it. We would definitely want to do it right. Um, so maybe one day. Okay, so I am Tech asks, what are your favorite bands and why? I like this question. Uh, I can only speak for myself here, but I'm a huge metalhead, um, having grown up in the metal capital of Scandinavia. I mean, that being Gothenburg, of course. I have three favorite bands, so, which are Slipknot, Rammstein, and Opeth. Um, I would love to collaborate with Opeth frontman Mikkel Åkerfeldt. I think his emotionally loaded folksy style would suit what we do perfectly. Uh, right now, though, I'm deep into more technical proggy stuff like Periphery and Meshuggah. While not my like top bands of all time, Meshuggah are definitely definitely among the best I've ever seen in terms of live performances. Um, this, I mean, this was a good question. I could talk about metal music all day. I'll spare you from that, though. Uh, Bahan Vanani, the trader, asks, "What is your favorite meadow animal?" And what is your favorite Book of Travels forum? I like playing the Lynx in Meadow. Um, there's no particular reason for that other than the th fact that I, 
I think they look kind of majestic. My favorite book of travels form is the Larker, because it exudes like a laid-back vibe that I connected with the moment I saw the artwork. Also in that artwork they have some kind of stringed instrument, like a lute or something, and I'm a... I, I play the guitar, so, so it fits. Butterhead asks, How did you guys all meet? What's your story? So for me personally, it was a, like, a series of coincidences that led me to the studio. My background is in what most people would call games journalism. Like I, I covered the games industry with new, news pieces, opinion pieces, game reviews, previews and all that jazz for Game Reactor, which is like a substantial outlet in the Nordics. Um, that led to some social media work for Electronic Arts which led me to community work for Paradox Interactive. Up until that point my work was on a freelance basis and through a mutual friend I got to meet Joe, our current COO, who hired me full time and he was friends with the Might and the Light guys, who just so happened to be in need of a community manager and the rest is history. But I guess the question was more about how the studio came about and while I wasn't there when it happened, I know that it was founded by a group of people who had worked in what is known as like the AAA space and wanted to make something of their own. Um, some may remember the Capcom game Bionic Commando Rearmed, which was released on Xbox Live Arcade and a bunch of other platforms, and Seven, I think, if, if I recall correctly, uh, Seven out of the 11 people who made that game went on to form Might and Light, and it's been growing from there. Serev Alidan asks, did our combat review PDF help the de developers with the upcoming combat rework? Uh, absolutely, like, the community feedback at large has been invaluable for tuning the new combat system, and we're very appreciative of every single one of you who took the time out of their day to try it out and give us their thoughts. Um, since this question was posted to me, uh, I've written a community post on Steam about this very issue. So uh, maybe you've read it. If not, then you can go and read it. Okay, another question from Vahan Vanani. And they ask, is your beautiful studio open for co-work visits? I.e. can one come and work next to the gang? Not with, of course. Um, we get visitors from time to time. Uh, anyone is welcome to come say hi or get a cup of coffee, as long as it's pre-arranged. We're probably not able to accommodate people doing their own unrelated work in our office space, but again, we're, we're happy to meet fans who, who come knocking. Sokyogu. Sokyogu. Sorry for <laughs> butchering that, but asks, will there be rideable animals or companions? If yes, then when? Uh, right now there are no mounts being worked on, so nothing is set in stone, but it's one of those never say never situations. We're certainly open to the idea, so nothing's ruled out. Like, pets and companions is something else, and that, it's, that is in the cards, but I can't say when you'll get to enjoy them today. Set Salazar asks, what do you enjoy most about game development and what is the least enjoyable about it? Um, I mean, I, I have my own generic answers to these questions that we'll get to, but I, but I also wanted to ask someone with more experience than I have. So I went and asked our creative director, Jacob, about this, and the first thing he latched onto in the question was what he enjoys the least. So he recognized that this might be a hot take, but his least favorite thing about game development is that everything's possible, meaning that you need limitations in creative efforts. At least that's his view. He said, and I paraphrase here, um, you can have a team of 700 people working on something for five years and still not have, an, have anything remotely close to a finished product. What he said made me think of something like Silent Hill, where the team put this dense fog over the game world to <coughs> hide the fact that the hardware wasn't powerful enough to render more than a few feet of level in front of you. And now that fog is this iconic integral element of the aesthetic of that franchise. Or take like Steven Spielberg's Jaws, where the mechanical shark just couldn't function most of the time, 
forcing them to be more selective when they actually show the shark in the film. Like, effectively making it much better and suspenseful. So I think the point he's making is that limitations will force you to be more creative and you have to carefully gauge what elements are more important in your work. As for what he said he liked most about game development, it, it was that it's such a broad and all-encompassing endeavor. Like, you can be a programmer and become a great game developer, and you can be a musician or an artist or a marketer and become a great game developer. That made me think of the first time I was at the studio and met the, the team. And he and I got into a discussion about what makes a game developer, because a lot of people in community management have this sort of inferiority complex. M maybe I shouldn't say a lot, but I, I, I don't know. But I certainly did have those thoughts of being like l the least important or the least talented person on any team. Uh, but he told me that, of course you're a game developer, Oliver. Which was like a wild thing to hear from someone who I know worked on Killzone 2, which is a game I love. And now, thinking about it, of course he was right. Like, every person who works on a game project is part of the development of that game. So nowadays when people ask me what I do, I just say I'm, I'm in games development rather than whatever it was I used to say. As for me, my favorite thing about games development is getting to see a team of talented people from various backgrounds do their thing and then have all those individual pieces come together to form something special and then ultimately have that thing resonate with an audience. I'm not sure what my least favorite thing is. Probably that nothing is ever truly finished. There's always something that can be made better or more polished. I don't remember who said this originally, but there's this famous saying that a piece of art is never completed. Uh, it's merely abandoned. And as a creator, if you ever want your work to reach your audience, you will at some point have to say, okay, this is good enough. And as we're our own harshest critics, it's hard to know when you're at that point. Okay, so Vinico asks, what games influenced you the most while working on Book of Travels? Uh, the game that we've talked most about in terms of what inspired Book of Travels is Bioware's Baldur's Gate. From all the way back in 1998, I think. Um, but I know that Journey by that game company has had an impact on us too. Uh, in fact, when I started working for Might and Light, Book of Travels was like casually described to me by a co-worker as Journey meets D&D. Which is a bit simplified, but still striking to me when I was getting to know the pro project. Dark Souls is another game that I've heard used as a reference internally. Uh, obviously not in the way that it's this super hard, dark and oppressive action game, but in the way that From Software builds tension and tells a story with environment and item descriptions. Odys asks, is it mandatory for the art team to love Tove Jansson's work? Yes. <laughs> no, no, I'm kidding. Um, the question continues, or overall how much do you think her art has in influenced Book of Travels? Uh, no, but seriously, the, the work of Tove Jansson has been hugely inspiring for our art team. Uh, we have a video on our YouTube channel called What Inspired the Book of Travels, if I remember correctly. And I think Tove Jansson is the first inspiration that gets brought up in that video. The movies present you with this wholesome, cozy world inhabited by vibrant characters, but it'll, it also has a certain creepy darkness to it. So the duality and balance of her work really speaks to us, um, and countless of other artists, I'm sure. Banana Math asks, despite all the crunch, are you proud of PID? It's clear a lot of love went into it. P.S. What's the story behind the secret message in outer space? Här till är jag nöd och tvungen. Oh, well, we're, we're very proud of PID. Um, well, I say we, but this was way before my time, so I had nothing to do with it. But yeah, Pit is very important to us. It was our first game, and we still get people coming up to us at events and such, telling us how fondly they remember it. As for the secret message, I had to look into this, and we're not exactly sure who put it in the game. 
The quote itself has its roots in Swedish 16th century history. Um, the details and accuracy of the accounts of that history is still debated, but long story short, there was this bishop named Hans Brask. Back in those days, Sweden and Denmark were at each other's throats, and the archbishop at the time was Gustav Trolle, who happened to be favorably inclined towards the Danes. And in 1517, there was a national council held, uh, which Hans Brask participated in, and they were to decide if Trolle was to be removed as archbishop. Now, Brask voted in favor of removing Trolle, but just in case this would backfire in the future, he allegedly wrote Här till är jag nöd och tvungen on a note and sealed it with his official seal. I guess because he wanted to have some proof that he in actuality was against removing Trolle from his post in case there would be repercussions. The, the phrase basically means that like my hands were forced, uh, that he had no other choice at the time. Three years later, the Danes invaded Stockholm, led by Christian II, by Swedes known as Christian the Tyrant, Christian Tyrannen, and what history ref refers to as the Stockholm bloodbath took place. Christian II wanted to punish those who had removed uh, Gustav Trolle as archbishop because again he was a bit he, he was a bit of a Danish sympathizer and then Hans Brask could refer to his note saying hey I didn't actually want to vote him out and like he was spared from getting his head chopped off regardless of how true this story is it's it actually sort of spawned the term Brasklap Brask being the guy's name and Lap being the Swedish word for written note, which could be anything used as a reservation in any situation. Kind of like a way to express yourself with uncertain caution. Yeah, we're definitely beating Denmark in the football world championship, unless of course my bad knee starts acting up. So the Brask Lap in that statement would be the bad knee. So yeah, sorry for rambling about bishops and Danes for a bit, but that's the origin of the quote. Uh, prior to reading this question, I had no knowledge of this whatsoever, so I had to do a bit of research. Thanks for unknowingly making me learn new things. Physics asks, So there are already forms in the game, but when will you be adding paperwork? <laughs> I like this. Uh, again, I I'm born and bred in Gothenburg. We're known nationwide for our dad jokes and bad puns. So I would let my fellow Gothenburgians down if I didn't include this question in the video. <laughs> I, 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 will pit I will put paperwork on the to-do list for the team, okay? Nemo is Nui asks, are there any plans for more shelter games? If so, is there anything you could share? Um. I mean, Shelter as a franchise is very important to us, and to many it's what put us on the map in the first place. There are no plans that we can tell you about right now regarding future Shelter titles, but we'd love to make more in the future. I can say that we feel there's a lot of potential for various kinds of experiences within that world, and the next time you see a Shelter game it may be something we haven't done before. Kind of cryptic, but, but yeah. Uh, Warden Raccoonu, uh, a good friend, asks I recently got, got myself a copy of Earthsea and Searchy. I don't know if that's how you pronounce it, but G Old Inspirations for Book of Travels. And I'm wondering if any of the team, <coughs> new or old, has had some new inspirations. I expect a few good of them are excited for the Mooming game soon, and that the Baldur's Gate 3 release slowed down dev time, understandably. Uh, I think we're all pretty tuned in to what the original vision for Book of Travels was, but of course we get inspired in various ways by pretty much everything we consume. Um, I know Aira, who's our head of production, and joined the team after the Alexis launch, has cited the free-to-play browser game Fallen London as a personal inspiration of hers, not least of which because of the amazing collection of story-driven items it has. And yes, we, we have our eyes on that Moomi game. Uh, I mean, by now, when you're seeing this video, the game 
is out, I think. Hello. And I'm sure we're going to be we're currently playing it. Uh, it looks really good. Um, and yes, Baldur's Gate 3 captivated quite a few of us, but but has been responsible for slowing down dev time because we're professionals, of course. Thanks for your question. Willow's Guardian asks, what are the initial M&D thoughts on the success of the merge store? Are there plans to expand it? Sales-wise, I'm not sure. Uh, that's not my field. But we definitely have plans of expanding it in terms of items on offer. Um, we're getting close to having mouse mats ready, for instance, and we're working on other things beyond that as well. Willow's Guardian also asks, why is the sign of may your tea never grow cold? Haven't y'all ever had iced tea? And some of us have cat's tongues, which are where we can't eat hot, like in temperature, foods. I insist on my tea being warm at most. Please let my tea grow cold. Well, we never said may your tea always be scorching hot. Like you said, you like your tea warm and warm is not cold, right? Uh, I don't think anyone in Braided Shore actually drinks iced tea, sorry. Noet Yafen asks, Other than hope this game will be a success, is there a vision or something you all look onto for in this game? Let me read that again. Is there a vision or something you all look, look, no? look onto for this game? Yeah. Not in the sense of an expectation, maybe more so of a small wish, even if it is illogical. Sorry for messing that question up, but uh, it's a good question. I I'm not sure. Maybe to be an inspiration to other developers. We make games that no businessman in any boardroom ever would say, like, make this thing. It's what's, it's what's hot right now, right? But they still find an audience. Um, I've had many people email me to see that one of our say that one of our games is just just what they needed right then and there. If we would go on to sell millions and millions of copies of our games, no one would be happier than us, obviously. But none of us went into game making, into the game making business because we at some point des decided that this is what will make us rich, you know. <laughs> No, I'm not saying that Might and Delight is the only studio in the world that operates like that, of course. Uh, but the more of us there are, the bigger our chances are to convince those brilliant, undiscovered artists out there that haven't taken the leap to do so. Uh, Sir Tim says hello and asks, Thank you for doing this. Uh, been a Kickstarter backer since 2019 and I have been very proud of the work the team has put into the development of this art piece. I have one question, but how is Flick doing these days? And the mischievous acts going on. <laughs> so so for those of you who don't know who, who Flick is, she's a cat that belongs to someone in the neighborhood. Um, and she often just walks into our studio when she gets the chance to hang out with us and make sure we're staying productive, I guess. Um, as far as I know, she's been doing great. She has become sort of a mascot for us, and we're very happy to have her over for visits. Emissiant asks, will there ever be trading between players? So we're obviously had, we've had these discussions during development, but the thing to be wary of in games like ours is ways for players to exploit systems like that. We wouldn't want someone who's played like 500 hours to be able to give god tier loot to someone who just start, started out. That would really wreak havoc on the game's balancing. We have been toying with the idea for players to be able to gift each other things, but right now I can't say anything about that, like what form that would take. Dissig or Dissige, Dissigs like I would have said in Swedish, asks, are musical instruments still planned? Yes. It's going to take a bit longer, but we haven't scrapped that, uh, that idea. It's it's still planned. Nathan's Tall 10 asks, can we have an updated roadmap from the one in 2021? Uh, the one that you can find on the game's Steam page currently has actually been updated since 21, so go check that out. Okay, Warden Furby, another friend, asks, is there a game you played prior to your education that flipped the switch for you and set your on the path to pursue game development. 
or even a game during education for a separate field that led you to game dev. So the first game I ever played was Duck Hunt on the NES. And like it blew my freaking mind. Just the the concept of having stuff happen on the screen that you can be a participant of. It was like magic to me. Um, granted, I I can't have been older than five years old, but still, I, I think my infatuations with video games was born that night, visiting my mom's old like old co-worker. Um, they were pretty well off with like an indoor swimming pool, and of course the Nintendo Entertainment System plugged into their large TV. And then a few years later I played Ocarina of Time and that's when my mind was opened up to the idea that video games could be more than just like the coolest toy. They could also immerse you in these fully realized worlds that don't exist in real life with memorable inhabitants and stories of their own. I didn't actually believe back then that I would be a part of making games in the future as I was more into either being like a paleontologist or, or a rock star, but the love for the medium just snowballed from there and I wouldn't be here today without it. Warden Furby also asks, do you find yourself sympathizing even with the predator animals as you play shelter games? I mean, absolutely. Of course, again, I wasn't part of the team when these games were made, but I know Might and Delight enough to confidently say that they didn't want to make any of the animals in Shelter to come across as villains or like monsters. They do what they need to survive, and when I lose one of my badger cubs to a large bird or whatever, I, I don't feel any hate towards it. I take it more as a failure on my part that I wasn't able to break, protect my young, you know? Uh, also, like, the lynx is a predator, and that's the, uh, like, playable animal in Shelter 2. Genghis Pawn asks, considering the submissions to the suggestions and ideas thread in this forum, and ignoring the comments that suggest features that were already officially planned slash promised at some point, which ideas have received serious consideration by the studio, and why are they interesting, and which ideas have been discussed? discarded by the studio as something that will never be done and why are they regarded as off limits okay so there are pages upon pages of stuff in there so i won't be able to go too deeply into it but for sure there have been things that we thought seriously about like one of the earliest things we observed was that a lot of players wished that there were more options for character customization so we started working on that pretty early on in the early access period um, we also looked at what people had to say about how death was handled in the early stages, which also has been fo worked on since then. I don't think there's something that we have disregarded immediately, like, we're pretty open about at least considering new stuff. Of course there are limits to that, we wouldn't start throwing in rocket launchers <laughs> or whatever, but I think anything, I don't think anything too crazy has been suggested. Evil Tuxedo asks, what's your vision for how players are supposed to play the game? How close are you to achieving that? Then what do you want to change slash improve most? We do have a vision for how we want players to play Book of Travels. Um, it's hard to say how close we are to executing on that vision, but what I can say for sure is that we're not there yet. Some players uh, are with us and gets the game almost immediately, but we've also observed many players not really understanding what they're supposed to do, like what their purpose is in Braided Shore and what the game is asking of them. In these cases, they typically take note of the gorgeous art style and then they kind of zone out. We want to change this with better main quest onboarding, helping players find their purpose in the game with clearer goals. We want to support a broader range of playstyles and even more character customization. None of these things happen without a lot of work and testing, so it will not be something that we just roll out within the next couple of months. But we have big plans for these things and are working on them. Most of the improvements we've made and are yet to make are highly dependent on good feedback from the community, so thank you very much for being with us on this journey. Our last question for this time around comes from Noem Sani 
who asks, what made you, the single person reading this, decide to make a game slash help creating one? What is it that you love about the medium? Again, I can only answer for myself here. I tried to get more people from the team to ship in with answers of their own, but turns out they're really busy, so <laughs> you'll have to do with me for now. But this ties back into what I said about Duck Hunt and Ocarina of Time. What I love about the medium is that it lets you have some agency in the story that's unfolding before you. Sure, the, the extent of that agency given to you has its limits, but what little of it you do get is powerful enough to immerse you in it to an extent that other mediums don't really allow. I feel like I was instrumental in the rescuing of President Graham's daughter in Resident Evil 4. I feel like I got to discover Rapture and its dark secrets in Bioshock. And when Samus lands on Talon 4 in Metroid Prime and looks to the sky, it's my visor that gets splashed with rain droplets. I wouldn't in a million years speed down the Hollywood Boulevard in a $500,000 sports car in real life, Los Angeles, but I can do that and more in GTA V's Los Santos. So I've, I've loved video games my whole life, pretty much, but I didn't entertain the idea that little old me could actually get to work in games until I was an adult. I've been interested in writing and was good at it in school, so when Game Reactor put a, out an ad for freelance writers, I sent in an application, never even dreaming that I would get a second look, but they got back to me and said welcome aboard. And not to repeat myself too much here, but the four years I spent writing there gave me a solid foundation and probably most importantly some contacts in the industry so that my name got thrown around when EA needed someone to help them with their social media. And if not for that, I most likely wouldn't know Joe today, who eventually landed me this gig, which has me answering questions from you people. So, um, yeah, it's funny how things work out. But that's all the time we got for this little Q&A session. Once again, I would like to thank everyone who submitted their questions, and of course, everyone who support what we do at Might and Delight. It, it's, it's really important to us. If you liked this kind of content from us, I'm sure we could arrange to do something similar again in the future, so let us know. Until next time, safe travels and may your tea stay at a, a comfortable temperature of your choice. <laughs>